That ignores the fact that in 1937, what we got was the Wagner Act, the National Labor Relations Act, which empowered organized labor with vast new powers and a, a, a heightened level of militancy. The number of strike days from 1936 to 37 doubled from 14 million to 28 million strike days in this country. In 37, you also had uh, uh, Roosevelt going after business in a big way by calling for an 85% tax on corporate retained earnings, uh, which is not uh, calculated surely to imbue confidence in investment. Congress didn't give him one that high, it gave him one of 35%, bad enough, and in a year it repealed that when it saw the harm that it had done. And of course the problem with saying that if uh, that the collapse in 37 was caused by a reduction in government spending, there are many problems with that, but it ignores this big one, and that is, how do you explain that after the war, when we had a drastic reduction in government spending, the economy finally boomed? You can't have it both ways. You can't say, well, when you cut spending by government, you, you uh, hurt the economy, and the implication is when you raise spending by the government, you help it, when you've got this remarkable recovery after the war and after Roosevelt was gone. You had a much more business-friendly administration under Harry Truman than you had under Franklin Roosevelt, which steadily and, and, uh, raised taxes throughout this period as well. Uh, in fact, Roosevelt at one point called for a 98% top income tax rate. He didn't get it because some Midwest congressman came from states where they had a 2 or 3% state income tax. And they said, if he gets 98, how are we going to get our 3 or 4%? <laughs> so they gave him one of 91%, again, bad enough, whereupon Roosevelt came back and by executive order imposed a 100% income tax rate on all incomes of $25,000 or more. I don't know about you, but a 100% income tax rate on all income earned after 25000 would have depressed me. Uh, fortunately, Congress overrode that, so it didn't, uh, didn't last very long. Uh, in any event, uh, it seems to me that we, to be thorough in our thinking, we have to look at not just what government does, but what the rest of us don't do because of what government takes from us to do what it does. Thank you very much. Of course, our side is not going to take this uh, sitting down. <laughs> I, I think it's very important that we address the issue of how we got here. Uh, if what happened was market capitalism uh, was an abject failure and we got here because of uh, problems with the market system, well, then you have all sorts of arguments that you need government regulation. But if what happened was government drove you into the ditch in the first place, uh, then you have to say, well, maybe government should stop doing some of the things that it's doing, and maybe what it ought to do is something different, which would allow us as individuals and entrepreneurs such as Pete Secchi here uh, to come out and create wealth for, uh, wealth for everyone. Now, if we look at monetary expansion, which the federal government has been doing, of course, that is, as Ryan pointed out, uh, what got us into the Depression in the first place, and that is what got us into the recession in the first place. Uh, John Taylor is, is, uh, and others have uh, documented quite well uh, that the monetary expansion, uh, which was the thing that fed the housing crisis down Greenspan, keeping the interest rate at 1% for over a year, and then increasing it from June of 2004 to 2006, increasing the interest rate to 5% from 1%, and what do we find? Then we find the housing bubble collapses. Uh, it is not a liquidity problem that we got ourselves into. It, it's an uncertainty problem. It is what we did is we, we have created uh, and currently are still creating what Bob Higgs from the Independent Institute calls regime uncertainty. No one knows what the rules of the game are. As Amity pointed out last night, you, you save Bear Stearns, you let Lehman go, you save I, I, AIG. Now no one knows what the rules of the game are. Uh, not only that, but we created uncertainty through discussions by the Secretary of the Treasury and the Fed Chairman. If you, as, as John Taylor's pointed out, if you look at the LIBOR OIS spread, which is a measure of uh, risk, um, you find it doesn't jump very much when Lehman fails. Uh, what you find is that it jumps two weeks later 
when we have the Secretary of the Treasury uh, going into Congress and saying, oh my gosh, the world's coming to an end. Give us $700 billion by Friday. We're going to give you two pages of what we think we're going to do it. We're not really sure. Uh, help us out. And then on September 24th, you have the President of the United States saying to the, to, to the uh, American people, financial assets related to home mortgages have lost value during the last house, dur during the house decline. And the banks holding these assets are restricted credit. As a result, our entire economy is in danger. And when you hear the President of the United States saying, our entire economy is in danger, it doesn't say, gee, maybe what you ought to do is go out and take some risk, loan to some banks, uh, expand the uh, capital assets of banks. And so the, it is this regime uncertainty that we continue to do. Uh, the government is then doing things that uh, Ludwig von Mises in 1927 said, look, what we're going to do is we're going to create uh, a depression, and then what's going to happen is that the uh, federal government is going to come in and do make works projects in a book called Liberalism. And of course, he says, and that's just not going to work, right? Because as Larry pointed out, you're going to just rob Peter to pay Paul. Uh, and, and yet, that is what we continue to do. The idea is that we're going to have all these public works programs, and, and that somehow it is going to work. Uh, and then finally, what we're doing is we're taxing, right? We, all, as Larry pointed out, one of, the, one of the things that caused the second part of the, the, the Great Depression was massive tax increases. What do you hear? We're going to have tax, we're going to have the tax and uh, the, the cut and trade, uh, the cap and trade tax, it's going to be a tax increase essentially, right? It's going to be more costly to use things which take energy, which means to produce stuff. Then what do we have? We're hearing that you're going to be taxed if you uh, hire someone and you don't put in the health care program that the government decides that you need to put in to do that. Uh, and now we know we have the expiration of the Bush tax cuts are going to occur in January of 2011. What's that going to double the tax on dividends? Uh, so what we, we're doing today are all the things that are putting us in the wrong direction and all the things that we did during to cause the Great Depression and keep us there even longer than that. I'll turn it over to Eric. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, I'd like to start with a story. I have a I teach a number of bankers in the program, and uh, they all tell me we've got plenty of money. We just can't find anybody to lend it to who'll pay it back. <laughs> and um, the problem is with the financial system, if you imagine there's a waltz, and it takes two waltz, okay? On one side, you have to have businessmen who have two characteristics, able and willing. In other words, they've got to be able to pay the money back, and they've got to be willing to pay the money back. And on the other side, you have the financial system, which is able and willing to lend the money. And the secret of it is able and willing. Now, the problem that we have that I see is that we distorted the economy. We distorted April and Milling on both sides, particularly with the Community Investment Act, which ought to be repealed up. Government should not be involved with directing credit. That should be left up to people who know what to do. In other words, we, we attempting to use monetary policy for social purposes has been a failure. And we've seen it in the housing crisis, and we spread this stuff all over the world. It's not the lack of government that's caused this, it's government itself. Now, how do we restore the dance? How do we restore the partnership? The fastest way to restore business is to cut cost. And what I see in the Obama administration is, let's just take a look at the minimum wage. And with a big argument from all the social people we have to raise the minimum wage we've ever offered. Well, youth unemployment, especially where I come from, is approaching 50%. So what people are finding out is it's a lot it's a lot more economically feasible to hire retirees than to hire young people. When I go on to McDonald's, who do I see? I see people my age helping me for hamburgers. Why? Because if you're going to pay a high wage, you want to get some quality out. In other words, why are youth wages lower? It's because they're not yet disciplined into the system. So what I'm saying is, is that what we should do is lower regulation. We probably should, I don't, I don't think it's politically possible to repeal the minimum wage, but that would be done. It would certainly bring the youth employment back. The Community Investment Act ought to be gotten rid of. And the regulations ought to be lessened. 